Hi there. So I'm here to talk. These are musings about inner source careers. I'm still in the musing stage, but I'm heading towards trying to come up with answers that serve the community because there's starting to be a number of people that want to enter into this kind of career. So, um, and that's great. I'm really happy to hear about that. All right, so for, for level setting, uh, this is actually a picture from the first year of OSCON. Uh, <laughs> they were into taking extreme pictures. Um, I wanna say that I started my tech career without a tech background. My degree's in French literature and I was recruited out of legal into my first job at a technical company. So I became a master of fake it till you make it. And I'm gonna be advocating strongly for that throughout this presentation. Um, I went to Apple first uh, and I worked there for almost years. And then I left and went to Microsoft <laughs> for six horrible months, um, which I, I quit on ethical grounds and came back to Apple uh, and worked for the balance of, of six years total at Apple. Um, it was, uh, the whole thing was a study in old school technical methods. Both of these companies were running differently, but very much old school engineering. Um, and uh, I had a lot of time to notice that broken cultures breed inefficiency. <clears throat> and I also noticed that, that in tech, you don't win because you're the best technically, which is totally counterintuitive, but Microsoft taught me that um, with their commanding market share, even though they weren't working very hard at um, perfecting their product. And I thought there had to be a better way. I spent the entire time, the whole six and a half years of, that I'm talking about going, this is ridiculous. There's gotta be a better way to do this. Um, so I felt like I was stuck in the salt mines. And those of you who've seen me talk a lot know I use this slide all the time. I really feel like engineering is a bit of a salt mine for maybe 85, 90% of the people working in this craft. And that's because of the old fashioned ways that companies are content to work. But I think they're only content to work that way because they don't know that there are better choices. Um, I wanted to find out a way out of the salt mines for myself. I wanted agency, even though I wasn't classically trained, I'm not an idiot. And I was tired of people talking down to me because I didn't have a CS degree. I wanted to do good while doing well. I didn't want to sacrifice that. And I really wanted to fly. I wanted to find something amazing to work on and I wanted to fly. And that was sort of my last thought as I was leaving Apple, um, which I did because Steve came back and it was time to lay everybody off. Um, but luckily, Sun picked me up, um, not directly. I was at Symantec for a tiny bit, but then I landed at Sun. And um, Sun was the perfect place for me to go to find all this stuff because they, their culture, their engineering culture had grown out of open source. So although they weren't actively practicing inner source, they were doing as, as close to that as you can do. Um, it was possible for anybody to see anybody else's code. It was possible su to suggest changes, not that you would all, they would always land and there wasn't a ton of mentorship, but there was um, a, a willingness to allow people to ask questions. Um, I said yes to Sun before I understood open source very well, uh, based on my husband's recommendation that it would be a good thing to work on open sourcing Java. Um, and, but the agency was there for the taking. As long as you, you know, held your hand up, you could basically get as much rope as you wanted uh, to hang yourself with there. And that was helpful for me. Um, one of the things that was so good about the way that culture worked, we were super interested in standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, now in the current culture of new um, talent looking at open source, this is a less popular thought. But this was super interesting to us because the people that were around us were all legendary. I mean, Bill Joy and, and um, Whitfield Diffie, who invented Diffie-Hellman encryption or RSA encryption, and, and um, of course, James Gosling, but pretty much everybody at, that I met at Sun, and also, frankly, at Apple, were a stellar people. Um, what I found when I met the leaders of these companies, and I had the uh, honor of working directly with the CEOs of all the companies I've talked about so far. Um, they were all iconoclasts and they didn't expect their people to be as iconoclastic as they were. There was a little more willingness to see that happen in Sun than there was at Apple or Microsoft. Um, I wanted a better signal to noise ratio 
and that drew me to Apache. I got very interested in Apache uh, about the time I joined the Sun and also in the collective triumph of open source because a lot of the things I hated about Microsoft were exactly what the open source community was trying to fix. Um, so I did my time at Sun. At some point while I was at Sun, I realized that I had stopped working for Sun and started just working for open source directly. <laughs> and that I think identifies me as a change agent um, because I, I had to gravitate towards the right thing instead of the expedient thing because Sun, like all companies, was not a perfect company. And there was a lot of attempts by the marketing community to um, leverage the open source halo without actually doing the work in the early days. Um, I found the whole idea of enlightened self-interest to be so informative of how I was running my career. That is kind of what I've hinged everything on since then. Um, if I can't muster enlightened self-interest about a given project, I probably need to step away from it because I'm going to need to give it more than it's giving me. It's like being a puppy. You know, you have to love your owner more than your owner's loving you, at least initially. Um, I wanted to focus on what is needed that aligns with what I was interested in. And um, so after six and a half years total at Sun, I, uh, well, six years at Sun and six months at Microsoft, I gravitated in the direction of just pure open source and started taking jobs where I was upfront with my employer that that's what I was doing. Um, so what does inner source need? If you want to be an inner source career person, how do you figure out what inner source needs? And um, those of you who've seen my talks before know that I often use this slide to describe the um, extinction event that old, uh, old engineering is going to go through as the comet of inner source inevitably lands in the tech industry, which I think, you know, we're starting to really see signs that that's happening. Okay, so first of all, I would say that we need um, honest leaders, honest practitioners. People need to tell the truth um, because not telling the truth sets up bad expectations in the customer and also in the engineering community. And to that end, I think we collectively in InterSource Commons need to think about a code of ethics for practitioners, um, kind of like the Hippocratic Oath. <laughs> I'd really like that to be a rubric of, of who we recommend warmly. And Claire and I've talked about this a lot, how to figure that out. There's always a tension when you take sponsorship money to also recommend those people. But I think we've separated that by choosing the Apache way of you know, creating individual membership. I wanna treat who we endorse in the same way. Um, I think transparency breeds honesty. So I wanna see transparent behaviors coming out of folks that are you know, being um, consultants in InterSource. And I think that we have the opportunity at InterSource Commons to create a referral service that's maybe got 360 ratings as part of its part of its makeup, and I have some ideas about how to make that not gameable because um, almost all of those systems are gameable in my experience. By the way, this picture is Cal Worthington, who was a very dishonest car dealer in America in Los Angeles for many many years. He did lots of stunts to get people interested in his business. So here he is flying upside down. All right, I also think that InterSource needs. Um, data-based evidence, more data-based evidence than we have now. So Klaus has done great work, uh, you know, writing papers, and there are other academics involved with us who've written great papers, but we don't have a whole lot of research that answers the big questions yet. And um, I think as consultants, we have an opportunity to convince our clients that that would be a useful thing for them to be involved in. So um, I think we need to research how and why InterSource works with data, uh, as in have some data that shows what the velocity expectations could be if you adopted open source methods and made onboarding easy, um, you know, did real advocacy, real, real mentorship, did real, um, real code review. Um, we also need to look at the role of metrics because everybody knee jerks right to metrics. We hear it, we've heard it here several times. Metrics are important. People that have hold the money want metrics, but um, we need to use them wisely and we need to think about that. And we also maybe should think about using them to subtly out the tyranny of bean counting. Because in companies where management is matrix to the extent that individual developers can't spend time on other people's projects if they're in a different project code, 
Um, that's obviously, you know, a bad idea. I'm sure it sounded like a good idea to the accountants that convinced management it was going to be great. But most of the people I know who work in matrix situations really hate it. And then I think we have an opportunity as, as consultants to also um, advocate for craftsmanship. This is obviously Marie Curie. Um, okay, I also think that we need to continue to make free resources available. It's our strongest suit. We are an educational nonprofit and producing content that is freely available and usable is a big part of what we do. This is a Moroccan woman teaching random British women at a hen party how to make proper tagine. Um, handing off recipes, handing off patterns, case studies is a lot of what we should be striving to do as consultants. So our work product should be happy clients and data for the foundation, if you know what I'm saying. Maybe also, if we can talk that client into building tooling, um, also bringing tooling in. Um, being open like this accelerates adoption. It also invites copycat competitors, the sort of Lyft versus Uber problem. And we're gonna have that problem. We have people with a more, a deeper pockets and more vested interest in being the first person you find when you, when you look up Intersource. That's happening now with um, Stack Overflow, even though I don't know that we've endorsed them yet as, as a, a helpful additive, although I know they wanted to be that. Um, I would like our reputation as practitioners to be built on public good. So getting your clients to do some public good. Um, we always envisioned Intersource Commons as partly a, a Trojan horse to get people to do open source, at least for Intersource, because it wasn't their competitive advantage. Um, okay. Uh, I also think that uh, companies are going to want to distinguish themselves in the ecosystem. So there's two ways to do that. But I think working on generic thing that everybody can use, which is what the weird wrench is supposed to talk about, but um, is something that uh, we should look for m members of the organization to do. But I think that consultants have a unique opportunity to do tailored uh, work for a specific culture that is maybe then more generically applicable. And that's what the tailor scissors in the bottom are for. So practitioners should focus on, on tailored systems Companies looking to distinguish themselves should look at tooling as they're fulfilling their own tooling needs to see if they can't build something generic enough that everybody could use it, or at least as a starting point. Um, and then what does Intersource not need? Um, I would argue that it does not need a tug of war competition. Um, I think there's plenty of market share for everybody. Everybody I know is clamoring for open, Intersource help. Uh, and in the engagements that I take, I usually try to keep them short because I'm just trying to understand the market um, because I'm coming to the end of my career and I don't really need the consulting dollars. But I do need to build a consulting arm of Intersource Commons. So that's where all this thinking is going. I think that Intersource doesn't need big, um, big coaching. Um, so I've got this, this identical army to indicate um, agile coaches. Uh, they're not actually this militarized, but they do come in and spend a lot of an, a given organization's money. And it's not clear that that one-to-one -one, uh, white glove handling always gets you to the outcome. I didn't see that happen at PayPal, for instance. They spent millions of dollars on agile coaches and they, they um, got about 16% penetration. We got to 24 with no coaches in less time. So or with Intersource. So I think, um, you know, the claims that Agile uh, has made that have driven well, uh, broad adoption don't actually happen in big companies, be mostly because companies can't give up top-down planning, which we call WAGILE, right? Um, so, and, but mandated tooling and mandated um, coaching just creates a rallying cry for, for um, pushback. So I don't think we need to do that. I still don't. And I also don't think that we need shyster um, people saying, oh, this is so easy. This is Lucille Ball delivering the vitamin to Benjamin segment. If you, any of you like classic television, it's this hysterical thing where she get, she's getting drunk because there's alcohol in that patent medicine and she's trying to deliver a message while she's drinking it. Um, oversimplified advice from famous voices isn't helpful because it's not that simple. And pandering to unrealistic executive expectations also doesn't help. Uh, I think as a craft, we need to think about being honest about how much lift this takes, but also we need to do the work to figure out how valuable it is. Um, 
Okay, so how can InterSource Commons help with all of this? Uh, well, I have some ideas about that. Um, first of all, I think that uh, practitioner listings are inevitable. I'd like to have them actually have value. So figuring out how to make them valuable is, is going to be important. Um, you've heard about the ISPO working group uh, that Russ has, has proposed, and I think that's a great idea to start writing down, you know, what you need to do inside a company to help, help give consultants a leg up. Um, I think way more artifacts so we can continue as InterSource Commons to collect case studies, patterns, anti-patterns. We can get those from people who are out doing consulting or people who are working within a company. Um, you guys are also consultants, even though you don't know it. Um, and then we need to do more analyst relations. I opened the conference with a pointer to the fact that Gartner is awoken to us now. Claire and I are very interested in, in improving our analyst relations and so is the marketing working group because that can only be helpful to getting, you know, building a market for consultants. And then lastly, and I say this with some trepidation, I've been involved, pretty involved in um, career support for InterSource Commons members. Um, that's people who have distinguished themselves by working in the InterSource Commons to make the foundation better. I feel like part of my job as the chair is to reach out to those people once they become members and see what kind of help they need to, um, to get on their game. Obviously, I'm not going to be here forever. So if we're going to do that as a formal service of InterSource Commons, we'll probably need to bake that in. But that, there may be room for that. Um, and then there's the question of certification. I honestly don't think that we need to do this, but I certainly had this conversation a few times now. And know they're very valuable in places like China and India. Um, here's the problem. They create liability issues for the organization if we are the ones saying, yes, this person is certified. Now, what we could do, and it's also really hard to be fair about it, um, what we could do is build coursework that leads to certification, but we'd have to get somebody else to do the certification to avoid the liability. And that's how most certifications are done. The only company I can think of that didn't do that was Red Hat. They spent a lot of money on their certification program. It was unassailably great. They had to do that to overcome pent up uh, belief that Linux was a toy. So I'm not sure that we have to do that. Um, so lastly, to people who want to do this job, who think they want to be consultants. I say, let's continue this conversation and really get specific about what's needed. There's no reason not to dive in. That's what this picture is supposed to be about. You should dive in though with the help of your fellow ISC folks. One of the things that happens to people who are suddenly employed to do something they've never done before is they tend to isolate and try to figure it out themselves because they're, they're getting paid. I'm gonna suggest that we should try to help each other through this first transition of figuring out how to consult. I've done more of it than probably anybody at this point. And I will tell you that it's a new game every time, um, but I'd be very happy to start talking to people about that. Um, stay connected through IRC, ISC, through InterSource Commons with other consultants. We should probably start um, you know, a channel about that. Build generic services any chance you can inside your consulting gig um, with a plan to open source them and involve researchers every chance you get um, as well, if, if they'll let you. And now in closing, I have to show you a picture of my friend Wavy Gravy, because he's got the final quote. He says, put your good where it will do the most. And that's what I've been doing for my whole career. I spend the whole time figuring out what I can do from where I'm sitting that will have the most, most positive impact next. And um, that I'm going to say is how to stay happy as a consultant. Um, so thank you very much for listening to me.